everyone. Welcome to Beacons of Balance. I'm Arlene. This is Linda. And this is our wonderful guest speaker, Dr. Deborah King. And we're here today. Uh, we're going to carry on talking about near-death experience. I want to welcome everybody to the show. Thank you for taking your time to listen to us, hear us, see us, whichever way you're getting us. We appreciate it. So, Dr. Deborah King um, has been a healthcare professional for over 40 years. Um, she as an RN and a psychotherapist. Uh, Deb has her MS in nursing and her PhD in clinical psychology. She was raised a Catholic, like me. She's recovered. <laughs> no, uh, she was raised a Catholic, but was always interested in spirituality and very sensitive to other ways of knowing. Um, she had her profound NDE in 2008. Um, she also has uh, two books, upcoming books that she's authoring. So that's exciting. And let me tell you, folks, her story, it just blew my socks off. I'm excited. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm very excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, we, thanks we, for coming. Yeah, we're excited. Yeah, I, I, it's wonderful that you asked. And I, it's, I think it's important to share all of our stories. So whenever we have a chance to do so, I think we all, we all need to, to do that because we never know who, who can be helped and in what way they can be helped by just hearing so uh, if this is new for anybody or not new and they want to do some more reading of some good seminal works, Ken's writing is, is superb. And he also publishes a, a monthly blog I'll just uh, share. And uh, just uh, a few weeks ago, so in January, late January somewhere, he published a very large blog that was a wonderful summary of a lot of his research, his NDE research, if anybody is interested. And he featured several very, very powerful NDE stories. So, and you can find that by just going to, um, I guess, KenRing.com or just finding his blog. So, so if you could just give us, you have so much, <laughs> you have so right. much there. But right. if you could give us just a brief yeah. over touch on a couple things, but then give us your big one and then the most recent. Yeah. My big one. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the big one was, but <laughs> right. There there were I feel like there's a lot of big ones, but thank you, um, Arlene and Linda. Uh and I um try to give some thought to how to, you know, summarize some of the events, the spiritual events in my life. Uh and focus on the balance, since that's the focus of your, your efforts here and your show, uh, that I think um, connect nicely with some of the spiritual events that happen. So I'm going to maybe try to make that, connect those dots a little bit if I could. Um, the first is to just say that um, I was, you know, I was very intuitive from the time I was very young. And uh, although I did not understand what the gift of intuition was or, you know, the clairs, clear audience, you know, clear sentience, feeling something that was off, what I knew was that when something would come over me that I couldn't perceive with my senses, my human senses, it was a feeling of feeling off balance, right? It was a feeling that something was about to happen or I was in danger. So balance immediately connects for me with, with uh, the gifts of intuition and other ways of knowing, because I think these are ways that our soul uh, lets us know what we need to know when something right. is not going right. First of those events, I'll just share quickly, uh, because I think it's something that's on our minds as parents and, and grandparents, certainly um, now in today's world more than ever. Uh, I was um, about seven and a half years old, was walking home from the store, which we did all the time at that time, um, bringing milk home for my mom, and a car stopped, and... Uh, now in my adult mind, thinking about it, I'm horrified, right? But I was young I, and we were taught, okay, if an adult speaks to you, you answer them, you're yes. respectful, right? You never ignore them. 
And it was a man and he was in the car and he stopped the car and he leaned over and rolled the window down, no electric windows, and said, you know, hey, little girl, can you please come here and tell me how to get to the RKO Keeks, which was a, a local movie theater uh, where we grew up and I grew up in Queens, New York. And um, I for a second thought, well, now that's strange. I'm a little kid. I don't drive a car. The truth is, I happen to know exactly where the movie theater was because I took ballet lessons right next to the movie theater. And I knew how to get there by public transportation. So I thought, well, gee, if I tell him the bus route, he'll be able to find it. And the bus route was very easy. That, that was all in my mind, like in a split second, I'll just tell him how the bus goes and he'll find it. And I started kind of talking loudly because I was maybe, I don't know, two car lengths away from his car. I don't know how many feet. And he said to me, you know, you have to come closer to the car. I can't hear you. And at that moment, something came over me. Well, Ooh. I'm I'm now yelling. I'm, you know, like got this little voice, but I'm yelling. And his engine was running, but I knew he could hear me. And when he said that, I took one step towards the car. And I thought I saw a flash of another person who I believe now was probably crouching down next to him in the in the front seat. And they were probably going to abduct me. And when I took that next step and I saw it, now whether I visually saw that with my eyes or whether I just sensed it, I can't tell you. All I know is at that moment, I, it was all the alarms were going off. And again, it's not like there was any objective evidence that said to me, you know, uh, you're in trouble. I just knew it. And I went to take a step back. And he was like, I told you, got annoyed. Come closer. I can't hear you. And at that point, I felt what I thought was one of my neighbors for sure. This was midday. Like at the scruff of my neck, like a mother cat would kind of pick up a kitten at the scruff of the neck. That's what I felt. And I turned around immediately, relieved, expecting to see one of my neighbors because I felt I was in trouble and I wanted to get away from this guy. There was nobody there, nobody there. And I took off running and he followed me all the way to my house. And then what you so did? That was my first, um, my first encounter with a, really a, a worldview altering, you know. Did you tell your mom? I, I told my mom. Uh, she, well, what happened he pulled up to the house. I ran up the steps. For some reason, my mother had the door locked. It was, it was, you know, midday. She usually, we didn't lock our doors at that time. And um, I ran in and told her. And when she came to the door, he gunned it on the, the gas and screeched, really literally left marks, rubber marks, onto the Whitestone Expressway. We lived right on the Whitestone Expressway. So if you were going to abduct a child, that road would have been the ideal place to do it because he could have been on that expressway in a flash and over the bridge and nobody would have known. Oh, I know. Did you guys report it to the police or was that not? That she, did, she did not. She, she locked the door. She said, don't go out anymore. You know, let's just stay in the house. She didn't report it to the police. But I, I also believe at that time, it was really hard for us to imagine that these things happen to children. Oh, I can know? imagine, yeah. Right? Like, I mean, now I don't think, I wouldn't give it a second thought. I would call the police immediately. You know, I think it was a, just a different time. And she might have thought, oh, well, she's overreacting. But she saw the car. And she heard him. And she, you know, she said, well, wh who is that? And I said, I have, have no idea. So... She knew, you know, oh, that you must have been shook up. Yeah, it's a great example of our inner knowing. And I always say as children, um, I think children, we do have that that extra sense and that gift, because I know I've had experiences when I was a little too to be told to warn, you know, not to do this or whatever. But you have that gut. Right, Linda, you have that gut instinct of uh, kids, I think, know. 
They're not dumb. You know, they're, we're given the protection. And that may it be our, our our angel that came in with us when we were born, you know, the, our helper that's with us all the way through until we leave here. And let me just add to the, the one important point that you're making, Arlene, because I think at that time, especially, we were we were taught not to listen to those things, right? Oh, yeah. No, don't talk about them. Um, you know, it, we, we, that was, you know, you know, children should be seen and not heard, yes, whatever, right. don't yeah. yep. crazy. And yeah. so I think it's so important for us to cultivate that with our children, which yes. is actually one of the purposes of my children's um, storybook, a picture book, because I think it's so important that kids learn to honor that knowing. And parents and, need to be aware, and this is a good, I just want to make this point yes. that are listening, that have little ones. If they have these experiences, if they're seeing whatever, don't push it away. Yes. Cultivate, bring it forward and kind of talk about it more to keep it fresh in their mind. You Absolutely. Know? They yes. lose it. You know, they lose yes, it. Yes, they do. They get and jaded little... by the world and all the things and they forget about it. Absolutely. And yeah, if, that if guy was go, out to kidnap you. I believe, I mean, it took me several years to put that together. And now when I think about it, it's just so clear to me what was happening. Uh, I, of course, I didn't know it then. I just knew it wasn't good. Um, but, um, you know, I share that story with my grandchildren, especially the, the you know, the two girls. Not to frighten them, but to let them know You're that, aware. yes, and to You're let aware. them know that they have to follow their own sense of what's, if they don't feel good about something, no matter what an adult is telling them, they need to follow that. So I, I, so if I hit the fast forward button, now it's just kind of to illustrate that that was, there were more experiences like that in my life that really led me to become more acquainted with my intuitive gifts and learn more about them. Um, one was I was in a near fatal car accident at age 17. And I had what I know now was an out of body experience. I had no idea what it was then. Um, but I quickly left my body, saw myself in the accident scene, returned to my body, told nobody about it and just tried to process that. That was like my own I thought perhaps it was a dream. I dreamed it, you know, who knows what happened. Um, I entered nursing school uh, right after high school and became uh, within the first two years of being out an ICU nurse. And <clears throat> I had an experience one night on evening shift where, now this was 1977. So <clears throat> it was right about the time that Raymond Moody's first seminal work came out. I had not read it yet. I did not know it existed. I did not know anything about these phenomena. The term near-death experience was never, you know, mentioned to me in school, right? We were never, this was never, even when we, we, were, we learned about caring for terminally ill patients or hospice care, this was certainly never, never part of the curricula. And, um, he had a full cardiac arrest and after his cardiac arrest did not regain consciousness, which was always our fear. And the technology in the seventies was not like it is now. I mean, our biggest fear was, okay, we're going to resuscitate somebody and they're going to get their heart rate and blood pressure back, but they will not make a neurological recovery and they'll, they will be brain dead. This, this was always a judgment call. Uh, and this was about 48 hours and he had not woken up. And then he did. I was overjoyed. I was off the next day. I went in to see him uh, because I was very involved with his resuscitation. And he looked at me almost like he saw a ghost. And he said, you're the one. And I, I literally remember turning around in the ICU, like looking in back of me, expecting that he was pointing to somebody else. And I, I said, me? Like, what did I do? Of course, I'm a recovering Catholic too. I thought I was in trouble. What did I do? <laughs> there was part of this that I think that was left out. When, when they were resuscitating him, 
right? Yes. They did it a few times and the doctor yes. looked at you and said, Deb, yes. that's it. Let's call yes. it. And, right. you yes. and you said, let's try one more time. Let's go one more round. Right. So and that's, and when that, it, that's when his heart started up again. That, yes. And, and so now and, he's telling you he's now he's conscious. Right. So he's conscious and he's telling me you're the one. And I don't know what he's talking about. I had no idea. And then he proceeded to tell me exactly what you just relayed, which was how I was going to bring it in. He said, I watched the entire resuscitation from up there. And he pointed to the corner of the ICU room where the, the cardiac monitors were. And I'm looking up as if I'm good. I don't know what I'm going to see. I'm like up there. And he goes, yes, I watched the whole thing. They were pounding on my chest. They were shocking me. They were giving me drugs. And they wanted to stop. And I heard you say to, and he described the resident who had come from a trauma resuscitation. He was wearing scrubs. He was covered with blood. Um, he described the anesthesiologist. We couldn't get his endotracheal tube in. Every detail that nobody would have known unless they were in that room. He was in the room, but he, he was in a, a full cardiac arrest. And he said he wanted to stop. He asked you to call for the time of death. And I heard you say, can we just go one more round? Which was code for, let's just go one more round of drugs, defibrillations. Uh, and in those days, the protocols were very different than they are now. But the point is, let's just try again. But I have to just interject. It's a wonder that yeah. the doctor back then listened to you. You know what I mean? Well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, we had a very strong camaraderie uh, in the trauma and the ICU uh, area and with the emergency room. Um, we really um, strong, strong teamwork. We had a sense of what I used to call gallows humor. You know, we had to kind of uh, there was so much that we were dealing with that we really had to depend on each other. And I was the nurse in charge that night, and he was the chief resident. And the way the protocol worked was the charge nurse and the chief resident ran the code. So it was a joint decision. Of course, the do it was the doctor's call. But um, the amount of experience that we had as nurses was always respected. And that was yeah. really a wonderful part of. I worked of, in a county hospital, and and that's it, they were, well, we, yeah. you know, I was teaching the puppies that were coming in. They didn't know yeah. nothing. While they're yeah. trying to figure out sterile technique to put a glove on, I'm delivering <laughs> the baby. But you know, one time at least we, we had, were putting the glove on. <laughs> one time we had a breach. We were booking in L and D, and we were pushing the bed back to go to the OR. And it was busy. And I'd given report on my other patient. And something told me to stop midstream and go look at her strip. And she was in D cells. The baby was in trouble. I called oh, the doc. He ran over. We tried to stimulate. We couldn't get anything happening. So we bumped the, the other one and took her right back for a crash section. If we hadn't done that crash section, that baby would have been gone. But that's that instinct. Yeah, uh, I was going to say it was your intuition that kind of stopped you. Like, wait a minute. And there was nothing objectively happening, but you no. knew. You I knew just gave stopped. report. I just signed off on the strip. And it mm -hmm. was like we were pushing that other patient back and someone said, check that strip. And I went over and she was yeah. in a major D cell. Wow. 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 Yeah. Well, then you, you know exactly what I'm talking about, you know, and, and I... This, when I said that to him, let's go one more round, it really was not just, well, just for the heck of it, let's try one more time. It was a knowing that came over me. Like that he, I he still, still had life in him. Yeah. Yes, that I felt like if we, we kept going, we were going to get this man back. But there was yeah. no objective evidence that indicated it. I mean, you could, you could feel it in the resuscitation room. It was just not going well. Uh, and so he kind of looked at me like, okay, Deb, you know, and everybody was literally shocked when we, we got him back. And so when he said this to me, and this is what I now know to be called a veridical NDE, that is 
this man was sharing his near-death experience with me and what he was telling me could be verified. Everything was exactly the way he described it down to the detail. For example, oh, yeah. I, I um, in the 70s, had very, very long hair, right? We all had this long flowing hair probably, right? And I used to put it up uh, uh, on top of my head when I was, you know, working. This was even before scrubs. So we were still wearing white nursing uniforms at that time. And, <laughs> and our <it's>, stockings. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> and garter belt, oh my God. And occasionally a cap, occasionally a cap. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he said to me, you know, you look so tired, nurse. You were standing there and you looked like you were just, and I was, I had, it was the, you know, the end of a very long shift. I had worked over and he said, your hair was falling down, you know, and, and it was, it was, I put it up in a clip and it, it, he said, I was looking at you, you looked so tired, your hair was falling down. And I'm thinking, how is this possible? Now, I knew from my experience with my father in the car accident that I knew that being out of one's body was possible, right? So in that moment, I'm saying, okay, I was up there. I was watching a car accident. So I believe every word you're saying, but I was not aware of the conversations that were happening on the ground. I just saw my body and saw the car wreck. He was telling me every single thing that had gone on. And then he looked at me and he said, you know, thank you, nurse. Thank you for not letting them give up. And in that moment, talk about intuition. In that moment, it's, you ever have one of those life-changing, paradigm-shifting moments where something happens and you're like, this changes everything. Exactly. Exactly. That that's that's yeah. what that was like. That it was changes like, your your thinking of what we were taught and everything. It's just out the window. Exactly, exactly. And exactly. how does one reconcile, like you're saying, what you were taught with how that happened, with my own experience of well, yeah, I was out of my body once, so I believe him. But how the heck did he hear this? And thank God I did that. Thank God I listened to that voice because. He was meant to be alive. This is, this is his story was not meant to end. So that, you know, that was an event that um, I kept in my pocket in my professional life. I did not feel comfortable sharing that with colleagues, uh, speaking with anybody about it. Uh, but I, at some point, uh, then became acquainted with the work of Raymond Moody yeah, and felt very validated when I started reading that still wouldn't talk about it because it was yeah. not mainstream. It was still fringy, you know? Yeah. Yep. Uh, and in healthcare, I will say it's more accepted, but it's still fringy right here in 2024, which is one of the things we really need to work to change. Yes. Right. So right. Um, uh, fast forward to... 2008. So long career in nursing. At this point, I had gone back to school, um, got my doctorate, was working in private practice as a psychotherapist. And 2008, I'm sure people will remember, was just of the year of the financial crisis internationally. It was a stressful year. Um, banks were in trouble, closing left and right. My husband was working uh, as a bank regulator and was heavily involved with um, the financial crisis under tremendous stress, tremendous, um, and was traveling around the country with, you know, working with banks that were in trouble. He was gone a lot. Uh, between the two of us, we were raising four children, the youngest of whom was autistic. He was coming apart at the seams because life was so out of balance that um, for an autistic young person, that's particularly stressful. His father was gone a lot. My own father was dying of cancer and he and I were extremely close. And so I personally was caring for my father, trying to care for 
you know, our youngest, my youngest bonus son with the autism, our three other children, um, trying to keep body and soul together and uh, went for a physical. And this is another such an important thing to embrace. Blood work, everything, EKG, everything was normal. And I remember the doctor saying to me, who I knew for quite a while, you know, all your numbers check out. This is all encouraging, but you just don't look well. He said, you just need to take better care of yourself, which was not something I was doing. So I believe the event that I had was a complete energetic depletion. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So as, let me when, just interject, as they say, if we don't take care of self in yes. honor, you know what I mean? Because we, yes. we think we're all and then some when we're doing these things. Where of we're course. Different half, yes. right? We have of to, course. especially as women, we have to be everything for everyone. You are a exactly. mother, you are working, Absolutely. your children, your father. Yes. So you have to be it all. But we yes. have to take care of self because if we I don't, wasn't, and yes. this is when spirit will say, okay, so you don't want, you're not <laughs> acknowledging, well, guess yes, what? that's exactly I'm right. I'm sorry, then go on. Okay. I know, like, that's exactly what happened in my opinion, because to this day, there really is no definitive cause for what I had, which was a full cardiac arrest. I did not have a heart attack. I have no plumbing problems. There's nothing wrong with my coronary arteries. I have no blockages. I, I literally, like somebody just pulled the plug. How old were you then? I was 54. And uh, I was heavily grieving, which is another really important point. I mean, grief is such hard work. And it's so soul tapping. It's so, especially for my father, who he had died six months prior to that. So he died in June of 2008. And it was around the holidays. So another trigger point, first holiday without my father, you know, my husband's running around the country. My youngest bonus son is coming apart at the seams. My other three kids are, you know, they're older, but they're like, you know, what's going on? It, it was really Balance was not anywhere on the landscape. And I thought, you know what? Uh, it was a couple days before Christmas. And I thought, I want to be close to my father. And I drove up to his grave, which is about two and a half hours from our home, our home then. And um, probably didn't eat or drink the whole day. I really don't know. Uh, just wanted to get up there and get back before it got dark which I did. I pulled in the driveway. My husband looked at me and he said, oh, I'm so glad you're home. It was getting dark and I was worried because both of my parents are um, buried up in a um, very mountainous, mountainous region in Pennsylvania. And um, he said, you know, you don't look good. I think you should go to bed early. Now, for him, this was his intuitive turning point because yeah. my usual response would be, well, yeah, thank you for thinking about me, but you know what? You're diabetic. So let's check your blood sugar and let's make sure the kids have something to eat and whatever the list was for that evening. But I didn't do that. He said, I wrote almost robotically put my, my purse down, hung up my coat and started walking up the steps. And I flipped him out a little bit and he followed me up like a little puppy dog. And I said, what are you doing here? And he said, Deb, I've been trying to get you to go to bed early and take care of yourself for many years. You really don't ever listen to me. He said, and you didn't even question it. He said, so you're freaking me out a little bit. Let me just, is it okay if I just hang around with you now? If he would not have followed that intuition, I would not be having this interview with you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because within <laughs> about 20 minutes after that was spoken to me, I was in a full cardiac arrest. And he full witnessed cardiac. it? And what? He, and witnessed, he witnessed it. And he witnessed it. And you'll appreciate this, Linda. So he has a cardiac history. 
My father had a cardiac history before he passed in June of that year. I had no cardiac history except for a mitral valve prolapse, which was just something that was monitored and was never considered to be a big deal. But because of my um, father and my husband, everybody in my house learned CPR. Now, if they weren't certified in school, because some of the high schools did it, I taught them CPR and I taught my husband CPR using an American Heart Association video sitting at our computer, just like we're doing now, watching a hands only, you know, a, a CPR video and never in my wildest dreams did I ever think that he was going to use, I thought if he, if my father goes down, he'll know what to do. Did I, do you think I ever thought in my wildest dreams, he would be using that to resuscitate me? <laughs> Isn't that something? Never, never. If you would have told me that I, I would have laughed. And, uh, I, you know, it was a very bad, um, what looked like was going to be a very bad outcome. I had multiple recurrent arrests by the time the team got there and the advanced life support um, team who went above and beyond in transport. I had recurrent arrests. By the time I got to the ER, I was having decerebrate posturing. And so if anybody is familiar with what that is, it certainly is at least at that time, and still to this day, is not considered to be a great prognostic sign. It's, it's no, a, not it's a at sign, all. Right? It's a sign of uh, what is usually permanent brain damage. You know, the brain is so insulted by lack of oxygen at that point that it's an abnormal posturing that the, that the individual is having. And um, when the team saw that, they said to my husband, you know, listen, this is not good. Good. Um, there's one thing we can try. It's a very new procedure, (laughs) but we really have nothing to lose. And it was something called therapeutic hypothermia. Yes. I've been hearing about that. Right. Where the body temperature is lowered. And he said, well, listen, um, if there's nothing to lose, do it. So I was in a coma. I was given this treatment, which saved my life and my brain with the intercession of God in my belief system. And um, it was a good team. You know, God worked through Western medicine. And I had a profound near-death experience sometime during the coma. I, I can't tell you when it began. It could have begun the second I lost my pulse or yeah. sometime when I, I, I really don't know because there was no connection to that from that experience to what was happening while Debbie was back down on earth and laying in the ICU. Uh, and the features of my experience, which are very similar to many other near-death experiences, were uh, an immediate knowing that I was out of my body. Uh, And this will probably make you laugh a little bit, especially Linda with your nursing background. What is, what does a good nurse do when you're not sure what's happening? You do an assessment. So the first part of the experience was I was in this profound um, blackness, not a tunnel, you know, not, I didn't have a sensation of a tunnel, but just a blackness with no margins, but I wasn't frightened by it. And I looked around, saw nothing, and immediately thought, oh my God, I think I'm dead. But it didn't frighten, it didn't frighten me. In fact, the thought was, wow, I, th- I think I'm dead. Like almost, like how cool, like what an adventure. There was no fear, zero fear throughout the entire experience absence of all fear or anxiety. The fear and anxiety did not occur until I returned to my body. And so what did I do? I thought, okay, well, I got to, I have to check this out. So I actually did the body check. I mean, I can remember feeling for my head, feeling for my arms, feeling for my entire body, like, okay, no head, check, no arms, check. 
And by the time I got to my feet, I was, I was like, okay, Deb, you are out of your body. Wow. And I thought, okay, you're dead. But again, it was not, you know, it's, it, it kind of can sound frightening even to say that word, but the realization was one of wonder. Like, I'm still me. Yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm still me, but I am out of my body. And the highlights from there that, that were features of my experience were ones of encountering a tremendous loving matrix of light. Uh-huh. Uh, I would say orbs perhaps that connected just lights that I pretty quickly was aware were alive. This was a yeah. living, breathing, almost like a spider web of light. And I became very aware that these were souls, many of which I knew, but I didn't know them from this earthly life. I just knew that I knew them. Wow. And that they knew me. It was, I, I felt like it was a welcome home party. I right. was, it was a tremendous feeling of peace. I was so in the moment. I didn't think about what was coming next. I didn't think about what happened. I had no memory or concern about how I became dead. <laughs> how I, that, that was like, okay, fine, I'm dead, but you know, let's move on. <laughs> there was no, like what happened to me? <clears throat> None of that. Did you see your dad? Yes. So in the experience, I encountered two souls. Uh, I encountered many, but only two that actually communicated with me. And as I was moving through the light matrix, I also had a life review, which you may have heard other yeah. NDE years talk about. I also had an interesting experience where I saw what I would call almost a life review of other souls. And I was given the message that no matter what happened to these individuals, in their life or lives, nothing could harm the soul. Nothing. Wow. And I was shown really tough stuff. You know, everything you can imagine that could happen to somebody that I remember looking and thinking, you know, that we would consider, you know, we could be harmed mentally, physically, but the message was we, we cannot be harmed um, spiritually. Well, what, the question I want to ask you on this, when you were there, did you have any sense of, I know you said nothing could harm the souls, nothing could harm the soul. Did they give you a sense of um, the souls, I mean, the people in human form here in earth, when they cross the ones that have done horrific, let's say like the Hitlers and and. and people like that did you get a did you see them there did you <laughs> did you run into well so it's an interesting question i i can't say i saw adolf hitler but what i was shown <laughs> what i was shown was people who were victimized and then there were also people who victimized others yeah so i i was shown both sides of that okay. di dichotomy and the central message was nothing could harm the soul. And back in my humanness, in my human worldview, especially as a healthcare professional, that's hard to wrap the brain around because right. there was complete balance, if you will, in that showing. That was the, the message was nothing can harm the soul. And in the years since that experience, I've done a lot of reading and research on pre-birth planning and soul contracts and um, the messages that our souls um, are given and the choices that our souls make before we incarnate. And so there must be some connection there. Um, but I, but I, that was definitely given that message. Um, and, um, it's really something I've thought a lot about. So basically, I mean, we have the contract, like we all have, I always say, this is like, um, a playhouse, you know, this is the yeah. school mm -hmm. and we're playing out. So people have different roles that they come in, um, with that they have to play. And, and, you know, it could be some horrific roles that they play, but there's a reason for it, for the others to grow, 
So things that we look at that are so heinous, there there is a reason. There's a reason for it. You know, uh, my remember my father came to me um, after he many 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 years after he passed. I was actually walking, doing a morning walk, and I saw you know like a cartoon, like a bubble. Where yeah. something written. Bubble, he, he yeah. was over. He was over here, and he said, um, "I started crying." I said, "Thank you. Um, it must have been so difficult to play the role that you played to make me realize who I am and the choices that I have that are different." Do you know what I mean? It was a very profound, just like a like you said, a knowing wow. that he came so that in. was a, val- a real validation. He came in, you. and there was a big healing with that. So I just yeah. wanted to mention that. So go ahead. I'm okay. sorry. Um, Whatever you do, you have to feel what you did to others. You have yeah. to stand in it. Well, and that was, um, thank you, Linda, because that really was the essence of my life review. I experienced events through the experiences of others. Not, I mean, I knew it was me, but the emotional experience, which, by the way, did not have any judgment in it through for, you know, or Let's say the judgment was my own. Nobody else, I did not, and I felt the presence of God and of source energy. Nobody was judging me. No, especially this divine power that I knew I was in the presence of. I was, oh, wow. This is how this person felt. Uh, And it was all through, as you said, you have to sit in it. And I was in it. I was in their experience and not mine. Um, so, so the two beings that spoke with me telepathically, uh, the first actually, which blew me away and still, still really does at that time in that experience, it made a lot of total sense. Like I was, I was surprised and happy, but now when I think about it, I'm like, oh my gosh, how did this happen? The first was my ICU patient, the one I had spoken with you about a couple of minutes ago, who had resuscitation and shared his NDE with me, and he was there. It was clear that both he and my father, who were the sec- this was the second soul I encountered, were quite surprised that I was surprised that they were there. It, it was clear that they had they had made it their business to be there for me. Like they knew this was going to happen and they would be nowhere else. That's the, that's, those are the best words I can find. And I went, wow, it's you. And he said, well, yeah, of course it's me. Like, you know, I made it my business to be here. And the message really was what happened to you when you and I were in the ICU was not, this was not an accident. This was purposeful. This and, and your experience in your car accident, which he spoke of was given to you so that you would know that I was telling you the truth about being out of my body. And now I'm telling you again, that your purpose is to share this with, with others. You can't, you know, you kept it secret for many, many years. You can't do that anymore. Exactly. my first response was, okay, I'll take that. You know, no problem. I'll take that assignment. And in a split second, I realized, wait, wait a minute. If I accept that assignment, I got to go back. And I did not want to go back. And this is where I think the, the issue of soul planning comes in because I said to him, well, uh, something to the effect of, well, you know, can't you give that assignment to somebody else? Or, uh, you know, maybe somebody else can share it. Or I don't even, it, it was a protest, some sort of a kind of a light protest. And he said to me, you were given the opportunity, the chance to choose whether you wanted to go back, but you've already made that choice. And that's kind of stopped me in my tracks. I was like, wait, wait a minute, I'm confused. I, I'm telling you now, I really, I don't want to. And he said, well, it's okay. Like he, he accepted that I could not, he goes, it's okay. You were given the choice, but you chose to go back. And I didn't understand it, but I trusted 
that somehow this soul was telling me the truth, which is when my father appeared and my father reassured me that we could never be separated. We never were separated that even though he left his physical body, he was very much with me all the time. And he basically promised me, said, I promise you that if you go back, when you go back, I will be with you. I, I can, you can never, we can never be separated. You can never be separated from this place. This place is within you. You, you're, wow. it's not, it, it's here. It's with you. And everything, I just soaked it up and I just was very reassured in the moment. Oh, that's and wonderful. I thought, okay, well, if my father's telling me this, I, I really trust this. And just like that, I was hovering over the ICU bed, saw my body for a minute, got very excited because it didn't look good. I knew exactly what was going on. And I thought, oh, dear, I don't know how this happened to you, but it's so bad. You don't have to go back in there and you'll laugh at this. I hope you'll laugh at this. I know I can laugh at this. I felt so spiritually expanded. Oh, I bet you did. So huge. So like no limit that we feel in our physical body that when I looked at my body, I thought, well, that's not happening. They're like, I'm not getting in there. <laughs> it's like, it's like being a size, I don't know, 16 and somebody saying you will now get in a size zero dress. Oh no, that's not happening. <laughs> that's what, that's what it felt like. It's like, okay, I'm not fitting in that thing anymore. And as soon as that happened, boom, I was back in my body and, um, it felt almost like a suction and it was a, um, confining, painful, frightening. The first time I felt fear in the whole experience was when I was back in my body. And I remember thinking, Oh, how did this happen? This is not good. Uh, and I proceeded to react to that by pulling out all of my, pulling out my central line, pulling out my arterial line, extubating myself. <laughs> oh, yeah, yes. See, the nurse's eyes are getting this big, right? Uh, and thinking, what, what's going on? And then looking at what was a, a very bloody scene and thinking to myself, Oh gee, somebody must, there must've been a trauma in this room. I, like <laughs> my brain was going into nurse mode. Never. I wasn't even thinking, you know, I was so detached from my body that I couldn't yeah. even make sense of this being me. Wow. And, um, uh, the staff of course were, I can remember seeing them, you know, I, I was in the ICU where I had worked as a nurse administrator. I was, very familiar. I was like, well, what's going on here? The ER must be hopping. There's, there's staff everywhere. Again, not even making the connection that I was the patient. And long story short, I had a, you know, a very miraculous, unexplainable uh, recovery, but it did take a while. I had uh, both a retrograde and an anterior grade amnesia. So I couldn't remember some events from before my arrest and around the event. And I couldn't make new memories. My husband used to call me the 51st States woman, because if you've ever seen that movie, you know, where she has this tremendous, I think it's a car accident and she can't make new memories, but she, uh, but that's permanent for me. Thankfully it was a temporary thing. And after about a year that went away and I was able to make new memories, but my neurological recovery was challenging. Wow. And um, every day is a gift. That's all I can yeah. say. Now, yeah. I know Arlene wants me to mention this, which is something I'm delighted to share because I haven't talked about this at this point yet in any interviews uh, because this is relatively a hot off the press. Yeah, this so is mind blow. <laughs> this kind of tells us that we're as spiritual beings, we're constantly evolving and our stories are constantly uh, unraveling. Uh, and in my event, my near death experience, as I told you, I was aware of many souls who spoke with me, my former ICU patient and my father. 
But I also had the sense of knowing others. One sense, and I can only describe it as a sense, a feeling, was encountering a soul that had a sister energy. It felt like a sister. And when I got back into my body and I was journaling, now you have to remember, I had tremendous neurological memory problems. I had brain injury. But the memory, the spiritual and soul memory of my near-death experience was completely intact. You know, in the early days of my recovery, I couldn't tell you what I ate for breakfast. But I could tell you the details of my near-death experience. And the more I journaled about it and the more I wrote about it, the more I retrieved. Awesome. And that... I interpreted that sister energy at that time as being my biological sister who was a strong advocate for me. She came from New York when I was in the coma. She was advocating to get me moved to another hospital, to a teaching hospital. She was, um, she was, you know, I owe so much to her because she was really, uh, and she comes by it honestly. She's a, you know, um, very, very successful attorney, retired now, but she knows how to advocate and she's uh, had a career as a prosecutor. So nobody messed with her. So she was, she was looking out for me. So I interpreted that because in the experience, I also could feel prayers. It's hard to articulate. I could feel prayers and grace and positive energy that I knew was coming from another place towards me. Uh, I couldn't hear voices. Some people say they could hear. I didn't hear that. I just could feel that I was being spiritually cared for. That makes sense. Yeah. And I interpreted that as my sister's energy. Uh, And when I came back to my body and she told me everything she was doing, I thought, well, that makes sense. That makes sense. I never never mentioned it, but I wrote about it and journaled about it. Hit the fast forward button 14 years, right? Because this December was 15 years since my cardiac arrest. And this happened last year. I... It was just about a month from now. So it's almost a year old. And I, that this happened, I uh, am an, I love genealogy. I love studying family history. Um, several members of my family, including my daughter uh, and my cousin, have really done a lot of research on the family. And so as a result, I was a member of Ancestry and 23andMe. And um I received an email, which was not uncommon. When you uh, enter these databases, if somebody who is related to you enters and they're new, you'll get a notification that'll say you have a new DNA relative. So this is nothing, nothing new. Usually they're distant cousins. Sometimes they're first cousins that I know of that just kind of got a gift from somebody and they, they put their, their, um, sample in, or they just decided to join. And this one said, you have a new DNA relative. And I just thought I would check it out and expect to see it was a fourth or fifth cousin or somebody that I knew. This one was very different. This notification said, you have a new DNA relative who is, and it was something to the effect of um, a close there's a, a close DNA relative. And when you search through the database, you can set a filter that the filter will search by degree of close, how close you are in relation. So I opened it up and what do I see? I see a notification from the system and a personal email, okay, that was sent to me through the system because now the person does not know your private email address. They don't know who you are, where you are. They can just send you a message, a personal message through the system. And she said, she said, I hope you're sitting down for this. 
I don't quite know what to make of this, but I have just found out that I am your biological half sister. Now, I, my human was shocked. On a spiritual level, my immediate response was, there you are. Yeah. That, that was my immediate response. And I had told my, my full sister, my biological sister afterwards, that I had had a premonition of this. But I really didn't tell her that the premonition was during my NDE. Right, right. And afterwards in meditation, I actually saw a vision of a genogram. So a genogram is basically, you know, something that I used in clinical practice to draw a family history. And, you know, males are on the left, females are on the right. And my mother and father were there and my two siblings. And next to my brother and my sister was another sister. Now, if people are deceased, there's generally a line that goes through them. There was no line, but I saw that for years. Right. I could not make any sense of it. I just thought, well, you know, maybe my mother had a miscarriage. Right. Uh, who knows? I mean, I just, I, I had no idea what it meant. But when she sent me this, I called her within five minutes. I knew exactly who she was. I knew exactly that this was completely true. And as it turned out, my mother gave birth to her when she was 21. She gave her up for adoption and never told anybody, as far as wow. we can tell. Maybe one of her sisters. Right. Uh, she's from a very large family. Uh, and the reason I commented at the beginning of the interview, um, Linda, when you said I have a sister who likes to be called Deborah, is because. Her name is also Deborah Ann. Deborah. Which is my name. <laughs> yeah. So my mother, if she was involved in naming her, which I believe she was, because from what we've can piece together, it was a private adoption. She wanted to remember her daughter. And so when I was born, she gave me that same name. Gave you the same name. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's been a year of you know, researching and getting the records from Albany because she was born in Albany. And up until a few years ago, these records were sealed. Right, exactly. But the record, but there has been law changes in certain states. New York has been one of them. And uh, she and I met, we met this summer. Um, she's seven years older than me. Um she looks actually more like my, my biological mother than I do. Oh, wow. Uh, so it was an amazing, an amazing story. And, um, you know, we hear so much of it now with all the ancestry and everything we're, we're hearing, but nobody ever thinks it's going to happen to you when you're sitting at your exactly. kitchen table, exactly. drinking a cup of tea and all of a sudden an email pops in and, oh, hello. So again, that, that, that imbalance between the human, like, what the heck is this? But the soul saying, oh, there she is. Just like yeah. matter of fact, like, oh, yeah. I knew it was only a matter of time before you showed up, right. you know? Uh, and so um, that has been a tremendous gift in my life. And for her, both of yeah. her adopted parents um, have transitioned and she grew up for her whole life trying to find her biological family could not because the records were sealed and only put her sample in 23 and me because her children wanted to find out about medical vulnerabilities. They said, you know, mom, you're getting older. You were adopted. We want to know about what medical things we should, we should look out for. Right. So after it came back, she looked at the medical things. She wasn't surprised. Okay, I'm diabetic. I've had, you know, orthopedic issues. Nothing surprised me. Here's the account. Have a ball. Look at the results. And her daughter called her up and she said, Mom, uh, have you looked at the ancestry portion of this? And she said, no, I just did it for you for the medical. And I didn't really look at anything else. And she said, 
mom, you've got family out there. And she said, what, what are you talking about? I, I looked for years. I couldn't find anybody. But of course, she couldn't find anybody because the records were sealed. Right. So, it, shows, it shows you how that's the yeah. um, beautiful part of all this technology that we have out there now that's, you know, joining us together and stuff. So right. yeah. what a story. I mean, we could go on and on with you because you could, you know, talk. Right. we'll have to. You'll have to come back and, and fill it was a delight meeting you with the rest of it. Um, yes. Deb. And um, so the balance of all this, if we could put it into in a nutshell, is, you know, just take care of ourselves, live in back, you know, keep checking in to where we're at. And um, it's all about love. As you know, I see your sign, I see your sign, I see your sign the back there. That's what we talk about. Yeah. It's all about love, and it starts here. We have to, yeah. And that's the whole thing: honor ourselves. And, yes, and, um, and I think I shared with you. If I have just two more minutes to just share with the audience, I feel so strongly about uh, being an advocate for self in health, particularly as as a woman. Um, and as we know, we haven't done a very good job in cardiac care with women and women are often dismissed. Oh, yeah. And I was dismissed for quite a while uh, at a very credible medical institution by a very revered uh, academic cardiologist who basically his exact words were to me, I don't know what's wrong with you, but I guarantee you it's not your heart. Yeah. There you go. And when you hear yes. that, you take that as written by God, right? That, uh, absolutely. Yeah, and that so, word yeah. and he and that's another takeaway is, yeah. you know, and I was intimidated by that. And I thought, okay, well, you know what? I am stressed. He's probably right. He should know. Um, and now I just feel so strongly that, you know, if that happens, what's the worst that could happen? You get a second or a third opinion. You continue right. to advocate for you yourself. Your and you find yeah. out that everybody agrees. Okay. Yeah. And then yeah. you sleep better at Fortunately, night. I don't know why, but I wasn't intimidated by doctors. And I would tell them off in a New York minute. <laughs> <laughs> you know, unless they were cute. A unless they were cute. They were good looking <laughs> and you get anything from I them. do that now, but I didn't do it. I didn't do it back in the day. <laughs> no, they were like, no. <laughs> Thank you so much. For sure. You're quite welcome. Continue the great work that you're doing. Oh, and you, thank you. We're, we're like thank all connected. So um, everybody, thank you for being with us. Thank you for seeing, listening, listening, hearing, uh, seeing, and subscribe, spread the word. We'll continue with this. Um, new things coming up. And Linda, what do you want to say? Be the change you be the change you want to see. Yes, and from our hearts to yours, Absolutely. always total love, light, balance, and peace. If we have peace. You have inner peace, you have it all. Yes. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Thank everybody. You so Bye-bye.